Hello, my name's Kate Storey. I'm a developmental biologist based in the University of Dundee, part of the HDBI. Um, and I'm going to chair this session. Um, so welcome to everybody. Um, this is a seminar which is part of a series organised by the Human Developmental Biology Initiative. And it's intended to facilitate a respectful discussion about sometimes cont contentious subjects related to developmental biology research. In organising this session, we, want, we aim to create a, an open and inclusive and safe environment where we all feel welcome and able to participate. And indeed, we encourage participation um, actively. There'll be plenty of time for discussions uh, uh, after each speaker and also more broadly at the end. Um, if feel, please feel free to uh, write in the chat any point um, and we'll pick this up later in the discussion. Um, and if you want to do this anonymously, you can submit your questions through Slido and, and Pilar will provide a link in the chat, which will allow you to do that. So please be aware that only the talks are going to be recorded, not the discussions. Um, and so um, we'll proceed on that basis. So we're fortunate to have two uh, fantastic speakers with us here today. Uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, Professor Misao. Pujita. Masao is a professor of bioethics um, at the Center for IPS Research and Application and also at the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Biology at Kyoto University. He's a member of the UNESCO International Bioethics Committee, the ISSCR Ethics Committee, and the Expert Panel on Bioethics of the Council for Science, Technology and Innovation, the Cabinet Office in Japan. Her research group is committed to investigating issues concerning unproven cell-based interventions, the use of human iPS cells to create primary animals and also to make germ cells, and related questions about domestic and international ethic, ethical regulation, government policy and public attitudes and current practice. And the title of her talk is an initiative to establish guidelines for fetal tissue research in Japan. She'll be followed. I'm going to introduce now also our second speaker so we can move smooth, smoothly through the, uh, the uh, seminar. Our second speaker is Professor Hafez Ishmali Mohammadi. He is an associate professor of ethics at Maastricht University. He's vice chair at the Center for Ethics, Health, and a member of the Council for Public Health Society in the Netherlands. And Hafez has a background in philosophy, and in music, in fact, he's a jazz guitarist, but perhaps not today. His field expertise additionally include health and social justice, justification of health policy, ethical issues surrounding pregnancy, and ethics of reproduction and the moral status of the embryo. His title today is A Fortnight Away on the Dutch Advice to Extend the 14-Day Rule to 28 Days. So we will begin with Miss Al and she will present her talk. And as again, I've said, her title is An Initiative to Establish Guidelines for Fetal Tissue Research in Japan. Thank you, Misa. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Kate. Um, I'm very honored to be invited to this prestigious meeting. And um, thank you very much for uh, giving me such a, a precious opportunity. Today, I'd like to talk about our project to develop guidelines for fetal tissue research in Japan. But before starting my talk, let me explain uh, this picture. This box contains my umbilical cord. This Chinese character, uh, crane and turtle, all mean celebration and long life. In Japan, when a baby is born, there is a custom of placing the umbilical cord in the wooden box and giving it to the parents. This comes from the ancient belief that the umbilical cord, which used to be called ena, has special powers to protect the baby. I'd like to talk later about the influence of such Japanese culture regarding ena on cutting edge science. Studies on early human development often use aborted fetal tissue, for example, to generate more mature germ cells from pluripotent stem cells. We need to co-culture them with aborted fetal cells. 
There's also a growing need for fetal tissue in basic research on genetic and infectious diseases and for the development of treatment. However, to procure such tissues, it is necessary to obtain consent from a woman who goes through an abortion. Therefore, consideration of the physical and emotional burden on the woman and respect for handling of the aborted fetus are also required. For this reason, the International Society for Stem Cell Research issued an informed consent standard for human fetal tissue research in 2022. And I was on the task force that developed this standard. And I cannot give you the full story, but the basic principles for obtaining consent from donors are as follows. Uh, first, respect for women's autonomy goes without saying. In addition, uh, the decision to donate tissue must be made after the decision to have an abortion, to avoid an abortion for the sake of tissue donation. Other principles include the prohibition, prohibition of monetary reward for tissue donation, prioritization of medical care for women over tissue collection, and exclusion of anyone involved in the research from the abortion. This standard is especially useful for researchers in Japan, where there are no clear rules for fetal tissue research. Therefore, our research team translated this into Japanese, and uh, that is now available on the website of IUCCR. However, this standard cannot be implemented as is because existing relevant regulations and situation must be taken into account. The standard also says, uh, regardless of what is in this ISSGR informed consent standard, any donation must also meet all applicable local legal requirements. Therefore, we decided to organize a multidisciplinary research group, including scientists, philosophers, jurists, and bioethicists to develop guidelines for conducting fatal tissue research and to compile an academic report that can be the basis for the guidelines. That guideline is not the national guidelines or anything like that, but the list for uh, local institutional guidelines so that the uh, researchers at our institution can follow. But today, I'd like to introduce some Japan-specific issues that were identified in the course of discussion at our uh, research group. I hope this will serve as a reference for implementing the ISSGR standard in other countries. So what are the issues, uh, issues unique to Japan? Uh, they are the lack of rules directly uh, regulating fatal tissue research, uh, the relatively heavy burden on women who have abortions, the possibility of male consent being required, and the ambiguity of the legal status of the fetus. Uh, so let me explain each in turn. The first issue is a lack of rules. Uh, regarding fetal tissue research in Japan. In 2002, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports Science, and Technology's Expert Committee on Human Stem Cell-Based Clinical Research began developing uh, guidelines on clinical research using human stem cells. At that time, procedures for handling fetal tissue were to be included in that guidelines because transplantation for patients with Parkinson's disease were highly expected. However, in 2004, um, after a scandal uh, like here, involving a clinic that illegally disposed of aborted fetuses as household waste, 
the committee suddenly decided to exclude the procedures from the guidelines, which meant that the clinical research with these tissues were banned. One reason for this was that the politicians and pro-choice groups opposed it because the reality of abortion clinics and the burden on women having abortions were unclear. Basic research using fetal tissue was outside of the scope of the committee discussion from the beginning. Therefore, it is neither uh, explicitly permitted nor prohibited. This situation persisted even after 2014, when the Act on the Safety of Regenerative Medicine took over these guidelines. Conversely, uh, some countries have permitted fatal tissue research through regulations. For example, uh, as you know, in the UK, a national overseeing body called the uh, Human Tissue Authority issued its guidelines in 2006, which defined the fetus less than 24 weeks old as the mother's tissue. So the mothers can donate a fetus that is her own tissue for research. In the US, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act of 1968 allows family members to donate the body of the deceased person. This is the low governing organ transplantation. And in 1975, medical research guidelines stipulated that activities involving deceased fetuses, fetal samples, or placentas are permitted only in accordance with the state or local law. This has allowed states to permit or prohibit research through the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act or uh, through their own rules. In France, the bioethics law was introduced in 1994. One of its feature was to set the category for human body which means the special entity that was neither a person nor a thing, but should be respected. Fetuses less than 22 weeks old were categorized as human body in 2004, and research use was allowed with the woman's consent. These regulations clearly define the donor and the fetus, but in our case, Japan doesn't have such a a legally clear definition of the donor and aborted fetus. This fact is related to the remaining issues that I'm going to talk about. But even so, in general, uh, a donor of fetal tissue would be considered a woman who goes to an abortion. The abortion rate in Japan is not as high as uh, other countries as this graph shows. And uh, in 2021, there are more than 120,000 abortions in Japan. Most abortions are performed in the early stage of pregnancies at less than 12 weeks. The WHO recommends the use of uh, vacuum aspiration and abortion pills for early abortion. However, in Japan, the WHO recommended abortion bill was approved just last spring, just last uh, April. And the vacuum as aspiration is used, but 80% the of these procedures are either curatage or a combination of these two, which are physically invasive and cost from uh, 540 to more than 1,000 pound which is not covered by national insurance. Since childbirth, fertility treatment and abortion are often performed in the same hospital, there is also an emotional burden on the woman having the abortion. Therefore, it is important to select medical institutions that are attentive to women who have abortions so as not to place an undue burden on them due to tissue donation. Furthermore, 
uh, as this map shows, Japan is one of the few countries where spousal consent is still required for abortion. The Maternal Health Act requires doctors who perform abortions to obtain consent from the woman and her spouse. This is problematic for women's rights. However, regarding fatal tissue research, if consent for abortion is obtained from both men and women in accordance with the current law, whereas consent for tissue donation is obtained only, for, uh, only from women, that rationale is unclear. Moreover, uh, when dealing with genomic information of fetal tissue, especially for germline research, it may fall under the legal category of personal information. We call it personal identifiers of uh, parents. According to the guidelines for the Act on the Protection of Personal Information, the personal identifiers here refers to the uh, base sequence making up the DNA, such as whole nuclear genome sequencing data, whole exome sequencing data, and whole genome SNP data, and so forth. So when addressing this information of parents, even if the information is anonymized, Japanese regulations requires researchers to specify the purpose of use and obtain consent from both women and men. The last issue is the ambiguous legal status of fetuses that are less than 12 weeks old. The ethical guidelines for medical and biological research involving human subjects include uh, dead persons in the definition of research subject and do not prohibit research involving them. However, the Postmortem Examination and Corpse Preservation Act and Graveyard and Burial uh, Act define a dead person to include a dead fetus who is older than 12 weeks. In other words, a dead fetus less than 12 weeks old is legally not a dead person. Therefore, it is not clear whether it should be treated as corpse or as medical waste. As a result, we may need to confirm the ENA ordinance before conducting fetal tissue research. ENA in Japanese usually refers to the placenta, umbilical cord, and omentum, which are expelled after childbirth. This was mentioned in my first title slide. The ordinances regulate the licensing or notification of companies that collect and dispose of ENA, as well as the condition of established uh, disposal facilities. Currently, eight prefectures have ENA ordinances, and some municipalities have their own ordinances. However, their contents vary slightly from region to region. The definition of ENA may or may not include fetuses that are less than 12 weeks old. It may or may not refer to research use as well. So researchers, medical institutions, and ethics review committees involved in fetal tissue research in Japan are uh, encouraged to check the ENA ordinances of their local governments. So why these ENA ordinances exist throughout Japan? And this is closely related to ancient Japanese customs. Uh, the photo on the left shows the ENA mound of uh, Michizane Sugawara, known as the God of Study. His umbilical cord is buried in this uh, red wall. The photo on the right shows the ENA mound of the famous Japanese samurai, Yoshitsune Minamoto. His umbilical cord is buried under this pine tree. 
And you can see both of these sites in Kyoto where I am now. And I took these pictures by myself. In Japan, there has been a custom to treat Enna with great care and bury them since ancient times. However, since the end of uh, 19th century, people's idea of hygiene had changed, especially after the uh, cholera pandemic. And the burying of the Enna was forbidden by local ordinances. But as the method and location to bury Enna varied from region to region, it is assumed that the different ordinances were created in the different regions. And I found it really fascinating, although troublesome, uh, how these ancient practices have influenced on cutting edge science. So this is a summary of my talk. We identified uh, several Japan specific issues that arise when conducting fetal tissue research. In order for fetal tissue research to be properly conducted, existing relevant regulations and situation in each country need to be considered in addition to globally common uh, principles. We are currently developing guidelines for fetal tissue research and also compiling the academic uh, report, uh, which these guidelines are based on. And we hope that the discussion that emerged from this process will serve as a reference for similar effort in other countries. We are conducting this project with many collaborators. I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude. In particular, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Saito of Ashby and Dr. Takashima of Saira, who always provided valuable insight from a uh, scientific standpoint. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Arf. That was very interesting and uh, inf informative talk, um, telling us uh, how distinct uh, cultural practices in Japan actually impact the ability to use uh, fetal tissue for research. Well, our next speaker is uh, Hafez Ismaili Mohammadi, and he's going to tell us about uh, his talk, A Fortnight Away, on the Dutch advice to extend the 14-day rule to 28 days. Go ahead, please. Thank you uh, so much for the invite. Thank you, HDBI and Pilar in particular, for giving me the opportunity uh, to share with you uh, the recently published uh, Dutch Health Council advice on the extension of the limit of research with embryos from 14 days to 28 days. Uh, so the 14 day rule is, is a rule that stipulates that um, in vitro culture of human embryos is not allowed to proceed beyond the equivalent of 14 days of embryonic development or uh, so to say the approximate time at which the primitive streak appears. It's important to know that this rule applies to supernumerary embryos uh, because uh, at least in the Netherlands, but as far as I know, in most countries involved in embryo, logic, uh, in embryo research, uh, uh, the creation of embryos for other research, uh, uh, other uh, purposes than reproduction is prohibited. So the 14 day rule therefore only applies to supernumerary embryos. And the question is whether this 14 day rule should be revisited uh, more concretely, whether uh, uh, we should extend the 14 day rules. Uh, so this advice specifically was requested by the Dutch Minister of Health and it was precipitated by all kinds of, of advances in human embryology and also by the creation of uh, embryo models. These are models which recapitulated the development of human embryos. There are non-integrated models and integrated models. So these non-integrated models, they uh, simulate the growth of parts of the embryo. So like um, they might be uh, simulating uh, an organ. So we have, there are brain organoids and liver organoids, or they might simulate a process such as gastrulation, 
those are the gastroloids. Uh, and then there's integrated models, such as uh, the blastoids, which tries to recapitulate the development, the full and integrated development of the human blastoid. Now, given these uh, scientific advances, uh, the minister wondered whether uh, there would be reason to extend the 14 day rule and whether there should be a comparable uh, limit for integrated embryo models or they're also called uh, embryo-like structures. Now, in order to answer this question and the committee was formed consisting of scientists, legal scholars and ethicists, I had the privilege to join that group and then we set off and tried to uh, answer these questions. Uh, so here are the two questions. Sorry, I missed the slide. Yeah, there we go. Now, we conceived of that first question, right? The balance, uh, the, whether the 14 day should be, uh, 14 day rule should be extended. Uh, uh, as a question of balancing the moral worth or moral status of the embryo on the one hand and the importance and the benefits of scientific research on the other. Uh, and in order to determine the moral worth of that embryo, we took what is known as a pluralistic stance. Th that is to say that we recognized and re respected the fact that there are more than one sensible and reasonable view on what makes an embryo worthy of protection. Common uh, uh, reasons for uh, conferring moral worth to the embryo are because the embryo might become sentient or it might become aware or self-aware or that it's part of the human species. And rather than selecting, so to say, for the strongest view in the eyes of the committee, uh, we tried to include as many views as possible, uh, as long as they were, at least in our view, uh, they met a minimal threshold of, of, of scientific soundness and, and, and ethical reasonableness. And I will discuss some of these views in the next slide. But one of these views, and it's a view on which there exists, I think, strong international uh, consensus, is the view that the human embryo's entitlement to moral consideration is widely assumed to be gradual and progressive in time and relative. What this means is that as the embryo develops biologically, its moral value also increases. And its increase in moral value is relative in the sense that there may be countervailing values, such as the importance of scientific research and possible clinical uh, benefits, uh, which may outweigh the embryo's entitlement to protection. So this is to say that although the value of the embryo increases, it, it never becomes uh, a categorical so that it always offsets other scientific or societal considerations. <clears throat> now, going back to that balancing act between the moral value uh, of the embryo and the scientific interests and benefits, if we focus on the left arm of the balance, we'll find two types of considerations. And first type of considerations is what we may call intrinsic considerations, which are considerations that matter for the embryo's own sake. So these are the considerations that ground the moral status of the embryo. Now, what could these considerations be? And analogously to the human adults, the considerations the committee uh, looked at included sentience, awareness, self-awareness, personhood, and species membership, given that those are also the considerations that underpin moral protection for human beings. Now, starting with sentience, to say that beings with sentience matter for their own sake is to say that these beings should, uh, in principle, be spared from the experience of suffering. For self-awareness, uh, this entails that someone should not be frustrated in pursuit of their ends 
And it, when it comes to personhood, it entails that someone's freedom should be respected and that interferences with a person's freedom should always be uh, conditioned on some form of consent. Now, these are typical moral considerations in the domain of humans and human conduct. But when it comes to embryos, uh, none of these considerations seem to apply since an embryo is not sentient has neither awareness nor self-awareness. And uh, in their embryonic stage, they lack the properties of personhood. So all those considerations fell away. Then there is species membership as a consideration, which is to say embryos should matter for their own sake because they are a member of the human species which automatically and by definition confers onto them moral status. Uh, you hear this argument a lot. But this argument, at least uh, according to the committee, and um, I agree with that, I think that this argument is a form of unwarranted discrimination, which is called speciesism. And uh, what is speciesism? Well, just like it is Impermissible, uh, sorry, just like it is in principle impermissible to discriminate on the basis of sex or race, it is also and equally in principle impermissible to discriminate on the basis of species. Because why should we, as a species of human, uh, the human species, why should we matter more than apes, whales, or elephants? Uh, there's that seems to be an arbitrary distinction. Therefore, species membership also did not make the cut. The only intrinsic consideration, which according to the committee holds water, is that of potentiality. That is the view that the embryo matters for its own sake because of their developmental potential, their potential to develop all those properties which I just mentioned. So. One could say an embryo's potential to develop sentience grounds moral value, or the embryo's potential to develop self-awareness or personhood. Those are properties that ground moral value once someone actually uh, acquires them, and therefore that potentiality as such also uh, deserves some form of, of moral protection. Now, this potentiality argument is ubiquitous, and it's very controversial. Uh, also, we didn't uh, 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 reach consensus in our own group, but given our pluralistic stand, we did not. Uh, we did mention it as a valid argument in favor of protecting the embryo, and thus as a reason to be careful with extending the 14-day rule. So, when it comes to thinking about reasons as to why we should not extend the 14-day rule, and this reason pertaining has to pertain to the intrinsic value of the 14-day rule in view of the committee, only the, the argument from potential uh, qualifies, which I, I mean, I can definitely imagine that that's uh, already a quite a contentious claim to make. Um, now, in addition to these intrinsic considerations, there are also extrinsic considerations. And these are considerations that pertain the way that we, uh, as a community of human beings with a social back, uh, sociocultural background, how we view and value embryos. Uh, now, one type of such an uh, uh, extrinsic consideration of a value is called the relational value of embryos. And this value expresses that there are more and that there are less appropriate ways of standing in relation to an embryo, which is to say that it expresses that it would be, for example, say um, indecent or improper or, or inappropriate to bring about an embryo, to create it, only to discard it or use it for all kinds of trivial needs. So the basis of the argument not, is not that it's bad for the embryo itself, but it's an undecent thing of human beings to to bring about these creatures just for trivial needs. That's not the way we ought to relate to embryos. That's the idea. 
right? That these behaviors would be unethical, even if the embryo has no interests or values for its own sake, which is not to say that it doesn't, but in addition to intrinsic values, like right, that even if the embryo would have no moral status, right? These reasons hold. So there is something about the relation between human beings and their embryos, which itself is worthy of moral concern. And this relational value is at the very least at tension with an extension of the 14 day rule. Another uh, extrinsic consideration is that of symbolic value. And to say that the embryo has symbolic value is to say that the embryo stands for something or it signifies something beyond itself, which is of ethical, social, or cultural significance. Uh, the most common example is that of a nation's flag. So the value of a flag does not reside in the colored cloth, but rather what the flag stands for. It might be the nation, history, its culture, its victories, its losses, or what have you. This, right, because of the value we attach to flags, is why our, to step on a flag or burn a flag is perceived uh, as impermissible or at least as offensive. And what goes for flags also goes for graves or burial sites or for Sacramental texts goes for the Bible or for old sequoia trees or even the number 13. Uh, all these have meanings. All these things have value or disvalue, not because of the thing itself, but rather because of what it stands for. Now, if we apply this idea of symbolic value to the embryo, the embryo might stand for a number of things, such as the sanctity of human life, the mystery of conception and birth or the miracle of life. What the symbolic value in the end stands for is something that has, be, has to be determined empirically by talking to people from all walks of life. But the committee did recognize that the embryo could have such a value for persons. Uh, and this brings me to an important endeavor of indeed discussing all these different values and views I mentioned uh, with a broad audience. And this is necessary to understand whether and to which extent people will accept the use of embryos for research and whether they think that an extension of the 14 day rule is permissible. This makes empirical research, this makes public outreach not uh, of de derivative importance, but it puts it at the heart of ethical reflection on, uh, on embryo research in general and the extension of the 14 day rule in particular. So to summarize, the, the method of the, of the Health Council was to, 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 to make a distinction between the intrinsic value and the extrinsic value of, uh, of the embryo. Uh, the committee did its best to identify and include as many of those values as possible. But for the intrinsic value, we identified potentiality to develop all sorts of moral features which people find important and which ground uh, 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 some form of protection. So it can be the potential to become sentient, self-aware, the potential to become a person and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and for extrinsic value, we identified the importance of relational value and symbolic value. And we added that a broad discussion is necessary to gauge what people's views are on the instrumental use of embryos, making embryos in order to uh, facilitate scientific research as well as for the benefits in the clinical uh, practice. Now uh, we come to the other side of the balance, which uh, holds the reasons in favor of an extension of the 14 day rule. And well, after that array of somewhat convoluted ethical considerations, this is a, a merciful, straightforward list of, of, of reasons. So first, we know that there exists a gap in our knowledge on embryonic development beyond 14 days. And research with embryos beyond 14 days is expected at least to generate fundamental knowledge about, um, for instance, uh, the gene expression behind the physiological changes in the embryo 
as well as the first steps towards the development of organs. And this in turn increases our understanding of human disease etiology, our understanding of how diseases develop, so to hopefully be able to prevent congenital diseases. Um, another reason to extend the 14-day rule is to improve fertility treatments. A better understanding of the causes of unsex uh, unsuccessful uh, embryo transfer and of the stagnation in embryonic development could help to increase the success rate of IVF treatments. And lastly, our understanding of human embryonic development relies mostly on human, stels, uh, on human stem cell models and animal models. And although we might eventually recapitulate the entire embryo development with embryo-like structures, validating their accuracy requires using human embryos as a benchmark. And this is a, a big if, whether we can do this with embryo-like structures. I've talked to many scientists, some are very optimistic, others are more pessimistic. I do not have the expertise to make claims about which one is realistic, <laughs> but uh, maybe we can discuss that. Uh, but the extension of the 14 day limit to 20 days would allow for the benchmarking of embryo-like structures against natural human embryos. And again, according to the committee, it's paramount, paramount to also gauge whether and to which extent the scientific and clinical benefits uh, resonate with a broad audience in order to create acceptance and trust. But based on the considerations on both sides of the balance, the committee concluded that it is impossible to pinpoint a moment in time beyond which research with embryos would become unethical, except, uh, uh, except in a late stage of development. So pinpointing, there's nothing about 28 or 14 for that matters, which is, uh, ethically uh, uh, important as opposed to say 13 days or 27 days or 29 days. But nevertheless, an important reason for the committee to propose a legal limit at day 28 is the societal perspective, which is closely tied to public interests that embryo research serves. So research up to 28 days in the development of an embryo can yield valuable knowledge that may be used to prevent all kinds of developmental disorders and treat fertility problems. Now, almost done, but I've not touched on the issue of embryo-like structures or embryo models yet. Uh, I'm sorry. First, this is a this is a visual representation of the arguments I just represented, and you can find. Uh, this and you can actually find the whole uh, uh, advisory report online and I can definitely send the URL uh, uh, so you can have a look for yourself. Now, should there be a comparable developmental limit for so-called embryo-like structures? And the view of the committee here is that when it is the case that there are embryo-like structures which fully recapitulate the growth of the human embryo, which is to say that requires embryonic and extra embryonic tissue to be there so that there are realistic, that there is a realistic likelihood that that model has the capacity to to go through the embryonic stage and to go, go through the fetal stage. And all the morally relevant features start to appear such as sentience, such as awareness, such as self-awareness. Only in that case, that basically they would be undistinguishable, the, 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 the natural embryo and the embryo-like structure. In that case, it is 
the view of the committee that they should fall under the ambit of the Embryo Act and therefore that the 28th limit should also apply to these fully integrated embryo-like structures. And in all other cases, they should be regulated, but then they should be re regulated as other biological material is regulated. We did not consider how that specific, how that regulation should take shape. So I'm talking about all the other embryo-like structures, except for the embryo-like structure, which has the full capacity and the active potentiality to develop into a full-blown human person. So we did not consider that, but we just made the distinction between embryos, which do have a, uh, a, 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 uh, a capacity to develop into human persons and those which do not. And for the first class, we think that it will be appropriate to uh, subsume them under the Embryo, embryo uh, Act and therefore that the 28 day, uh, day limit should also apply to that class of embryo models. And I think that's it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That's very insightful telling us about how the different considerations were were explored in, in the, the Dutch um, uh, Health Council.